Um, hello, everyone. I uh, hope you've been having a good time at sub 0 0.1. Um, yeah, in general, this is a substrate conference. Um, if you heard, you've heard a lot of people building um, on substrate, but I think the thing kind of maybe less spoken is you know the fact that you know a lot of people are interested in building on substrate because of Polkadot, this kind of, this kind of larger network. Um, and so I wanted to uh, talk about how exactly the mechanics and kind of what you need to do to actually join this network. If you're building awesome substrate chains, definitely we want you to join. Um, this kind of tells you how. Um, but first, let's talk about what is Polkadot. So uh, Polkadot is a network that connects blockchains, ultimately a vision towards a multi-chain future. Um, Polkadot attempts to solve three problems. First being interoperability, the ability for blockchains to talk to one another. Scalability, the ability for these blockchain distributed systems to do more. And shared security, basically trying to avoid different blockchains from competing over like you know, scarce resources, things like users or computation or stuff like that. Um, but I think it's also important to try to argue why we think there's a multi-chain future ahead of us. Well, I think first we definitely know that the Blockchains will be in our future, and it's because blockchains ultimately solve trust problems. You know, they're open, they're decentralized, um, they enable uh, people to interact in a way where they can have less trust and more truth, right? Um, and then specialization, I think we can help solve scalability issues. Like really, when we're talking about um, specialization, a blockchain that tries to do everything doesn't quite do anything the best. And as a result of trying to do everything, it's just not as performant. If you can specialize a blockchain, configure it to be doing its one task the best it can, you can actually gain performance and as a result gain scalability. And then if you have all these specialized blockchains, ultimately interoperability is what adds the real world value. You know, these individual blockchains, these individual pieces of logic doesn't really um, add value to the overall network. But when you can have them talk to each other, communicate, and actually use each other, that's where the real, real world value comes from. And so this is kind of a, a picture maybe you've seen before about Polkadot. Um, you can see in this middle we have the relay chain. Um, this is itself a blockchain. And all around it are all these parachains. Um, there's a lot of mechanics and stuff around this. But you know the, the truth is there are a lot of people in this room who want to be this square right here, one of these parachains. And I'm trying to um, explain you know, what does that even mean, right? Uh, and I'll try to oversimplify it to try to get across the message of why you might actually want to be a parachain and why building on substrate may enable you to do that. So what does it mean? So as a parachain, first you get the opportunity to put your blockchain's latest blockhead onto the relay chain. Easy enough. Next, as a parachain, the blocks you submit are verified by validators using a WASM runtime you're able to store on the relay chain. So if you're familiar with Substrate, you know that your runtime is composed of WASM. This WASM is stored on the relay chain and it gets verified by validators. Um, finally, you get the ability to communicate with other parachains using an abstract message passing system. Great, but what do these things actually mean? What are the underlying messages here? Well, because you can place your blockchain's head onto the relay chain, you can actually achieve deterministic finalization for your chain. This means that you can like, offload consensus, the, the, the hard part of trying to reach finalization, to this shared network. Um, because the validators have the WASM runtime for all the parachains, you actually share the security of the validator pool with everyone on the relay chain. Anyone in this large validator pool can help validate your blockchain. Finally, um, because message passing is tracked on the relay chain, you can actually prove the delivery of messages. And this really facilitates trustless interactions. And this is such an important part, which is so hard to achieve on these distributed blockchain systems. Great, that sounds awesome, right? So everyone should become a parachain. Well, unfortunately, there's some scarce resources here. Polkadot has n squared complexity. So as we add more parachains, it becomes increasingly harder to add a next one. Things like networking, message passing, block size, they can all limit what a single relay chain can do. Um, we have ideas, I mean, I, again, I, I, uh, this is way above what my pay grade, but um, ideas of these nested relay chains where you have the actual Polkadot relay chain, and again, it is just a blockchain, so connected to it could be another relay chain. And you can have these kind of um, ecosystems, right, like a gaming relay chain where all these other parachains to this relay chain um, are gaming, and then you have a DeFi relay chain, and this all finally connects to the main Polkadot relay chain. But this is kind of, you know, a little bit ahead of, you know, what we're able to accomplish today. But this is kind of a bright future of how we might even solve the scalability issue that a single relay chain can only achieve so much. Let's talk about relay chain volume. So optimistically, the Polkadot relay chain may support up to around 100 parachains. That's kind of what we're hoping for. And across these different slots, we're going to have different kinds of para objects, basically. Things that are um, putting things on the relay chain. 
So first we have some system level permanent chains. Um, these are things like the nested relay chains, but we also have other system level things. I think an example is um, we have ideas or thoughts to um, move the balances feature of the relay chain off to its own pair chain. So the relay chain maybe only manages the actual um, pair chains, message passing, that kind of stuff, but the actual balances is managed on a pair of chain that's connected to it. So that would be like a system level chain, right? Then you have these least slots. These are basically the, the, the normal pair chain. So if you win an auction, you get a, um, you get a slot on the a relay chain, you become one of these uh, permanent slots, or not permanent, but you get a slot basically for a lease during this time. And then finally, this kind of this new thing, maybe you heard of it, maybe you haven't, these parathreads. And basically, we think that any of these extra um, capacity that the relay chain could support, we can actually have this parathread system where um, people who, uh, who want to use polka dots, but don't necessarily want to commit the huge cost to get a lease slot, maybe who want to just try it out, or maybe even people who are, had a lease slot but no longer have one can continue to use polka dot through this parathread system. So let's go a little bit into parathreads and parachains. Um, the thing you should know about them is that ultimately they have the same developer API. So from the perspective of um, Polkadot in terms of developer API and perspective of you as a developer building on Polkadot, you don't have to do anything different if you want to be a pair chain or a pair thread. In fact, you can freely swap between the two. And this is one of the features that we have, and I'll talk about that more later. But what is different about them? Well, there's a different acquisition process. Um, exactly how you become a pair thread or a pair chain is slightly different. I'll talk about that too. Um, there's different scheduling and throughput. This is the main one. Where basically pair chains offer you full throughput. You get like the premium priority on the relay chain. Where pair threads are kind of more pay as you go. It's what's available and what you pay for. And finally, the economics is a little bit different. You as a dot holder who's paying to be a pair chain or being a pair thread, the, exactly what you're doing with your dots is a little bit different. And we'll also go into that um, later in my slides. Okay, so let's talk about the how. So how do you become a para thing, right? Well, the first thing to realize is that Polkadot is just a substrate chain. So I'm gonna, again, this is a substrate developer conference, I'm gonna talk to you about Polkadot in terms of the modules that enable um, para chains to exist. Um, first we have the registrar module. This basically manages all the registration across all the para objects. So active, inactive, para thread, para chain, all that kind of stuff. That's what's happening in the registrar module. Um, uh, it also actually supports the parathread auctions. So in here, it tracks the active parachains, and if you want to be a parathread and you want to get um, a slot on the relay chain, you basically do an auction into this module to get that active slot for that um, few blocks. And we'll get in, go more into that a little bit later. Um, then there's a parachains module itself. This is the actual execution validation logic for parachains. Um, it supports message passing, it stores the latest parahead and the runtime code, right? Then we have a slots module. The slots module is actually what handles these more complicated pair chain auctions. Um, it manages pair chain slots and even holds the deposit. Um, when uh, you win a slot, it will hold your deposit into this uh, module. Um, and finally, we actually have a crowdfunding module. And this is a really cool thing I'm not sure many people are familiar with. Um, the crowdfunding module allows the community to fund your pair chain auction. So you, you as a person may not have like, um, all the money for your great idea, but you have the great idea and you have the developer expertise you can actually use the community to fund and back your parachain auctions. Um, and ultimately this crowdfund module helps you do that by collecting the funds, putting you into the auction, and track community contributions. Okay, so we're gonna go kind of deeper into all of these things. First, let's talk about para auctions. So the parachain auction mechanism. So the parachain auction mechanism uses a candle auction. A candle auction is this auction where basically, I think back in the day, they would light a candle and they would do some bidding. And basically whenever the candle went out, this is kind of a random time, the, um, the auction would close and whoever was the last bid would win. And for the same reason, and yeah, and I'll talk a little bit more of that, but that's kind of the idea here that we don't quite know when the end happens. Um, this kind of auction is initiated by governance, so maybe a democracy proposal, maybe, I don't know if there's, there probably won't be ever pseudo, but you know, you can basically say, hey, there's more room for more parachains, governance can go through and initiate a new auction. The auctions happen one, step, one at a time, and they auction off a two year slot. These slots are split into four parts, which are six month leases. Um, what's cool is if you win this auction, you put your money into a deposit, um, but then you get all of the dots back to you at the end of the lease. Let's talk about the candle auction system. So the candle auction system kind of has two periods. There's an opening period and an ending period. The opening period is basically um, time to allow people to realize there's an auction, to make the initial bids, to kind of figure out what the right general price might be for um, uh, a pair chain slot. Um, but then you reach this ending period. And um, this ending period goes, um, is, is known, it's fixed. Um, and any time during this ending period, it could randomly close. 
But the way we do this is we actually let the entire ending period go through. So during these ending periods, everyone's bidding, everyone's you know going up and higher and higher or changing whatever kinds of bids they have. And then once the ending period is over, we then retroactively decide what the ending block is. So whatever the winner is of that block, that's the winner. And this is ultimately encourages healthy price discovery and just discourages sniping. I don't know if you, if you all use eBay, right? There's some person, one second, who jumps the bid up a bunch. This avoids that. You don't know when it's gonna end until after it's ended. So you're here trying to make bids which are truly what you think the value of this um, slot is. This also helps mitigate the effects of malicious block producers. So um, as a block producer, you ultimately have the ability to maybe ignore a transaction or not produce a block or do any of those kind of things. If a block producer know, doesn't know when it's gonna end, they don't really have the incentive mechanisms there. They just wanna collect their fees, right? So it kinda helps that. Um, another thing is that this kind of mechanism doesn't require a commit reveal scheme. So I think there's another auction called like a victory auction, where basically you can like, um, you know, have some kind of, um, say I have some bids, it's you know, um, encrypted or like, you know, hidden, and at the very end, everyone reveals their bid and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of a two message process. Here is just a one message process. You can make an initial bid and you can win, not having to do anything else. So let's talk about the mechanics of the parachain auction. So you can see you have Alice, Bob, Charlie, David, Emily, and they all are bidding on um, a same slot. And again, the slots are broken into these four lease periods, um, all six months. Um, you'll see that um, a person will say what lease periods they're interested in, and the bid, the amount of dust they're willing to deposit to, for those lease periods. Now what might be confusing at first is that this isn't like a normal kind of bid that'd be broken up like this. Like you see Alice here has bid 200 for four slots. Alice isn't saying, oh, I'm willing to pay 50 dots per slot. Actually, Alice is trying to say, I'm willing to lock 800 dots worth of value. That for each of these quarters, um, she's, um, she's willing to keep 200 dots locked away. Right? So you can see here, if you um, have four slots and you bid 200, you actually have a locked value of 800. Whereas if you only try to pick one slot or one a quarter, and you only lock, say locked in 200, you see the locked value is only 200. Of course, we try to maximize the, the auction mechanism, tries to find the right pairing of people. So you know, like Bob and Charlie would be paired together, Dave and Emily would be paired together, Alice would be on their, her own, um, and try to figure out ultimately what is the, t the largest total among this. So even though someone like Dave has the largest bid, when paired with Emily, who has a relatively small bid, the overall total value, locked value here, is less than what Alice would have done. So Alice would actually be the winner in this pair, pair chain auction. Does that make sense? Mostly? Okay, nodding heads, good. Um, okay, and let's talk about allowed bids. So we actually have some limitations on what kind of bids you can have. So first, you can have multiple bids for the same slot. So um, you can, you're able to say, make a bid, say I want all four quarters, I want all three quarters, I want two quarters, that kind of thing, and I have different amount of bids, um, bid price on each of these things. So maybe like if you're able to obtain all four quarters, you're willing to deposit a lot more. But if you only have you know, two quarters, that's fine, but you're not willing to pay as much for that, right? Um, but there are some things. First, ranges must overlap, i.e. you cannot have bid three and bid four. Uh, you, you see that bid three and bid four would basically give um, Alice the full four quarters, and that would conflict with bid number one, which is asking for the same thing. Also, you, can't, um, you must have continuous lease periods. Basically, we don't want people to have like Q1, then not Q2, and then Q3, Q4, because this is like an onboarding process, offboarding process, onboarding process. It's not really a natural flow for being a parachain. Cool. And so again, this auction system is great, but to be honest, it's probably going to cost quite a bit of dots to be able to get into this wins auction. So if you don't have the funds yourself, you can crowdfund your parachain. You can actually allow the community to give back to your parachain and um, allow you to win these auctions. Um, the incentive mechanism here is basically to reward those users with your native token. Um, and then um, the crowdfund um, module automatically handles the rest of the auction process for you. So let's take a look at the mechanics of that. So um, if you want to start a crowdfund, first you must make an initial deposit. Basically, you know, we're trying to, I guess, prevent civil attacks and you know, try to um, make you pay up front for the kind of costs that it, do, it costs on the relay chain for doing a crowdfund. Um, and once you make the initial deposit, anyone can contribute. But you must at least contribute a minimum contribution. So there's a minimum contribution limit for that basically is the cost of us tracking someone's contribution um, to your uh, crowdfund. Um, Every time a new contribution happens during an ending period, it triggers a new bid, so it's automatically bidding for you, basically. 
Um, and then uh, when you make a crowdfund, you set an end date, a specific end date. And this end date can actually span multiple auctions. So you can have an end date which goes, when they say, over two auctions. And if you don't win the first one, maybe your uh, crowdfund will win the next one. You'll see there's the initial deposit, the amount raised, and there's also a cap. So you cannot raise more than the cap. So I know some things like GoFundMe or some of the other crowdfunding services allow you to go way over the limit. We actually limit that if you say um, very firmly at the beginning how long the crowdfund is for, how much I want to raise, and that really gives a good idea for people who are backing you what is going to happen, what they expect to happen when they support your crowdfund. And the mechanics to run, so ultimately the module generates a child tree. Um, if you want to learn more about child trees, I have a talk tomorrow as well um, about storage. But we have a child tree which tracks user, user contributions. If you know anything about Merkle trees, basically you can use the hash of this Merkle tree to verify um, any of the contributions of the tree. So someone can say this tree off chain and we can use this, um, this uh, tree head to basically verify, yep, these are all the bids, these are real people who've contributed. Um, your crowdfund can be a success, as in you win one of these auctions, or a failure, as in you reach your end date and you never won one of these auctions. Um, but you know, in either situation, you'll eventually retire, right? And when you retire, basically, people um, can recollect their funds. It's nice. And finally, if you're not able to do a crowdfund, if you're not able to um, get enough initial deposit to win an auction yourself, the final option we have for you is a pair thread auction. Um, the pair thread um, system in general is much easier to um, enter. Um, it first it uses an English auction. This is the very standard auction where everyone's raising their hand saying, I bid higher, I bid higher until someone wins. Um, pair threads need to lock um, a nominal deposit which can be refunded. So again, in order to become a pair thread, you really, as a much, much lower um, amount of dots you really need. Um, the auction itself happens every block. And the number of winners um, in a pair thread auction is determined on your thread count. So how much availability there is on the pair, um, on the relay chain itself, can, we can have a fluctuating thread count. And basically, um, however much we can support, we will support winners to join and, put, uh, and participate in the network. Um, and in this situation, whereas um, in the pair chain auction, dots are returned to you, you're actually paying fees here. So the dots used in the bidding system for the pair thread auction are actually consumed. So um, the way that it's currently um, programmed in Polkadot is that 20% of this contribution goes to the block producer. So whoever produces the block that you want an auction in gets a nice little bonus. And then the other 80% goes back to the treasury, which is, of course, we know um, funds, more community um, things, and um, basically as a way for Polkadot to give back to people who want to build on it. Um, so the mechanics of a pair thread auction. So we actually take advantage of fees and tips. So if you're familiar with the Ethereum world, you might know you can increase the gas cost to increase the priority of your transaction. So if you want to make sure your transaction gets on the next block, you can do some crazy high fee and you can get in there. And we actually have a similar system in Substrate where you can leave a tip. And these tips basically incentivize the block producers to put you higher in the transaction pool. They want to, they want to basically you know, mine your transactions so they can get your fees. Um, in this case, you have Alice, Bob, Charlie, Dave, and Emily again. They're all making this call to select pair thread. This is basically making a call to a bid. But you can see that Alice, Charlie, and Emily have all made a tip to say, hey, you should consider my transaction a little bit more than the others. And as a result, in the transaction pool of Polkadot, Alice, Charlie, and Emily are higher than Bob and Dave. In our virtual situation, we have a three pair thread cutoff. So basically, we just have some logic that says, hey, the first three people in this transaction pool who made this call are the winners. It's that easy. So you can see here, this kind of auction happens every block. And there, there's a natural um, economy that's happening around the fees, right? Like in the situations where there's lots of traffic for a pair thread slot, the fees just go up. Um, when there's not a lot of traffic, fees go down. It's possible you could win a slot without paying any extra fees at all, right? And this is kind of a really cool natural system. In order to do this, we have this signed extension logic. I think I'll go a little bit into it. It's actually a cool feature. I don't think anyone else is going to be talking about Substrate, and it's quite a little bit technical. Um, so winning a pair thread auction. So if you win the slot, great. You'll be queued to submit a new um, head on the next block. So you can make a bid on one block. The next block you'll figure out if you won or not. And then you actually get four slots to submit your new head. So um, yeah, if you miss your slot, you get three additional retries. It all works. So here you can basically just have some window of opportunity to um, uh, put your new head onto the relay chain. So um, this kind of window here is basically allowing for any type of network propagation, time for you to collect the block, that kind of stuff, right? It just gives you a little bit of leeway. Does this make sense? Good? Nodding heads? Okay, great. Um, okay, so then this one aside. So um, I don't think this is talked about any time else at Sub-Zero, and of course this is a developer conference, so let's talk about some of the developer tools. Something that's new in Substrate, which didn't exist in the last Sub-Zero, is this thing called signed extensions. We actually use this for this pair thread auction system, and it's quite clever. 
Um, this is the function for a paired auction. You can see, besides the function header here, it doesn't, there's no logic. If we read the comment code, it's everything else checked for in the transaction signed extension. So how can we use this no code to do a cool pair thread auction? Well, basically, we take advantage of this new um, signed extension feature. The feature in general is a way for transactions to be extended. Um, in one literal way, you can add extra data to your normal extrinsic format for your blockchain. So if there's something about your blockchain where like, I always need this extra piece of data in there, you can do that. Um, but in addition, there's this validation function which allows for transaction queue to quickly eliminate transactions based off some logic that you decide. So if we take a look at this, you can verify implied information about the signature. This is um, an example of a checking replay attacks. So we use it for checking replay attacks. Um, so if you're building different substrate chains, um, you know, might know that the transactions might actually work on other substrate chains if we didn't check that the transaction has encoded into it the information about the, um, the genesis block. But it doesn't literally include the genesis block into every transaction. That's like a huge waste of space. What it actually does is it, there's some implied information where we actually, when you generate the signature for your transaction, you take the transaction, you take this genesis block, you form the signature with that information in it, and then you take out the genesis block information and just pass the transaction itself. We know on our own substrate chain what the genesis block hash is, so we can add it back and then do the signature verification in that way. So you can actually kind of sneak in some data, or you can actually have literal data there and have that be verified. But you can see this is kind of a cool feature. Um, you can also increase decrease priority in the transaction queue. So this is the whole fee system, right? So if you, we have implemented fees using the signed extension, if you add a fee, we will make sure it gets to the right block producer and we will basically increase the priority of your transaction queue. Um, you can also decrease the priority. If for some reason you can detect some data in there is you know, really crap, you can decrease the priority of, um, of a transaction before it even gets to your network, right? And finally, you can trigger additional logic for certain functions calls within your runtime. So the signed extension knows about the, the functions that you're calling, and you can add your own additional logic wrapped around it. So this is actually how we limited chain functionality in Kusama. So in Kusama, you might know, we, you know I think we just heard that um, we, uh, we just enabled um, transfers. And even before that, we disabled governance, we disabled all these things, just to make sure to make sure it works. We actually use signed extensions to say, hey, is the call coming in calling balances module? If so, sorry, no. And then when we want to enable it, we just remove that one check. And basically now we can enable these, uh, uh, these calls to the balances module and stuff like that. So you really have now this plug to access these transactions, do verification, do priority handling, all before it even hits the runtime execution logic. Cool. Cool. Okay, pair economics. Um, so pair chain economics. Um, locking your dots isn't free. That is the economics, that there is an opportunity cost to taking this thing which is worth value and locking it away from your ability to use it. So ideally, you are trying to lock your dots away because you think by, you, by joining the network and participating that you'll increase the value of the dots. And ultimately, this is a good return of investment on the dots that you locked away. Pretty much makes sense, right? Pretty simple. Parathread economics, a little bit different, but it's the same kind of thing. Ultimately, what you're trying to do with parathreads is incentivize collators to, um, to pay this bid, to make this bid, pay this fee on your behalf. And the way you do that is basically you incentivize them with your own native token. So native token payout can be the transaction fees collected in that block, that totally makes sense, but can also be some additional logic that you add to your um, parathread, like some parathread token sponsorship. Where basically, um, you can see here the graph, this is the value in dollars, um, this is the number of relay chain blocks since last finalized parathread head, and the longer and longer your blockchain has hasn't finalized, a or hasn't put a block on the um, relay chain, the more this function will want to pay the user who does it. And eventually we reach a point where um, you will get paid more in your native token than it would cost you to pay the fee on the relay chain. And this is good for you, you're getting paid to do this. And this kind of natural um, 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 economy will basically allow um, blocks to naturally be produced when the pair thread bid is less than the native token payout. So this is nice, and this is kind of how it works. And of course, you know, this, um, the cost of winning a pair thread bid is going to go up and down based on the, um, the usage, right? You know, based on the availability of pair thread slots um, on the relay chain. Make sense? Nodding heads, good. Okay, so pair life cycle. Um, and so what's really cool, and you know, I think um, a feature that's not really well represented until now, right now, about pair threads is that it actually completes the life cycle of what it means to be a pair chain. You know, it's kind of a little bit awkward before when you have pair chains, and at some point maybe you w didn't win a slot, and now you're just 
kind of going to nothingness, right? Like you just can't produce blocks. That all of your um, all of your consensus is basically kind of like for naught, right? Um, and with pair threads, we actually give a really great offboarding story. If at any, for any reason um, you don't win your slot, or even if you want to sell your slot, you can become from a pair chain to a pair thread. You get the same full security, the same instant connectivity, but you just have less kind of volume throughput, right? Or if you're a pair thread and you say, hey, I want to just try out the network, see if it's actually you know, hyped up as much as it's supposed to be. Um, you can try a pair thread, start working it, and be like, wow, this is a really awesome network. I'm doing really awesome things. I want to increase to go become a pair chain, get that full throughput. So you can upgrade and, um, and become a pair chain. And what's happening here is actually the ability to swap freely between pair chains and pair threads will actually create like almost secondary markets for parachains. That um, there will be people who say, you know, like the, it, it's not well understood necessarily what the value of a parachain is today. And it may, may change drastically over the six months, you know, um, one year that um, we initially launched a polka dot. So this kind of swapping mechanism can allow pair threads and pair chains to kind of have this economy to kind of buy and sell the slots based off of um, uh, what it, the, the, the um, interpreted value is. And as a result, we actually get a really um, good idea of what a pair, being a pair chain is worth. And this really kind of helps just the overall economy. You don't want to go all over the place with the prices. Here, with this kind of natural um, uh, marketplace, you can actually derive very quickly what a natural price for being a pair chain is. Cool. And of course, earlier today, um, hopefully you listened to Rob's talk and maybe you participated in the workshop um, about Cumulus. So, you know, ultimately you are building substrate chains today and you want to maybe get on this network, follow these kinds of different processes I, talk, I talked about. Well, we have this library Cumulus, which makes you easily convert your substrate code base into a compatible Polkadot parachain. Um, it's broken up into a few components. I won't even go into it. Uh, you heard about it earlier today. But this is really the starting off point. And the, the main goal here is that, you know, along with the knowledge you have of how to become a parachain, you need to ultimately write a chain and then make it um, uh, join the network. And with Cumulus, we're trying to make that as easy as possible. All the work you've done is for something, and if you want to come here, it, we make it as simple as possible for you to do that. And yeah, that's the end of my talk, and I'm very happy to answer any questions. I'm Julio. Um, how much do you estimate is going to be like a minimum amount for the crowdfund? You said. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. I can work a little bit backwards from that. So to win a crowdfund, you need to win the pair, pair chain auction. To win the pair chain auction, um, there's some math you can do. I think there's like 10 million dots. We expect that 50% of the dots will be locked away. So if you do the math, there's like average price per slot of like 50,000. I don't know. I, don't, I, 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 I kind of hesitate to say any numbers, but. Ultimately, for a crowdfund, you will need to um, uh, basically be on the order of that average dots to win an auction. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Yeah. So there will, I mean, there will be some price. You, you'll be able to see in an auction how much, um, it hap how much it, uh, slots are going for, and basically set your crowdfund to that price. I, I would agree. I think what you're saying is maybe for the very first crowdfund, it's a little bit hard to know. Um, but... I don't really have a way to say that it's going to be this price. But I can tell you, 10 million dots, 50% locked, you can do some math. And 100% of, uh, of those dots are recovered like back to the, to the users or to the yeah. chain. You're talking about for a crowdfund, right? Yeah, afterwards. Yeah, so the crowdfund, all the 100% of the dots do go back to the control of the parachain. Mm -hmm. I think there are some underlying mechanics where a malicious parachain would be able to move the dots to another loca location. So actually, you can, you can make a call as a parachain to basically say, I change the, the address where the return dots go to. Um, I think things like governance can handle these kind of malicious parachains, help recover the funds from a user. But at the end of the day, if you don't do anything and you do, like, do the natural process, yes, funds will go back into the account. And naturally, the module which handles um, of the, um, the crowdfunding will allow users to recover their funds from that automatically. Okay. What are transaction costs then? Like when, when the 100% of odds are recovered, what the transaction cost of all that operations that were made in on chain? Yeah, I think I think there's a there's a nominal. Is you basically make one call, and I'm sure there's a fee for that. But we actually do some logic in the um, in the code itself to reduce the fees of transfer. So we don't, for example, we don't charge you a transfer fee. Um, but we, I think we do obviously charge just a normal call fee. It's going to be the cost of a transaction. Like it's going to be like one small small uh, cost to make one call to recover my funds. Yeah, it's going to be minimal. All right, thanks. Questions. Cool, we have a question there. Uh, 
Well, <laughs> kind of an obvious question, but when can we um, hook our first parachain to Kusama? That is a great question that I don't have the answer for. I think that people are people at Parity are very, very hard at work. Um, hopefully, you, if you went to the um, um, the Cumulus uh, workshop or talked, you'll see that it's still kind of something that's very much in progress. But we're on the cusp of that, really, if you look at it, right? We have Kusama. We have um, a chain that's working. There's governance happening. The next step is kind of that thing. And I think that's what we're working for as hard right now. I, I, I can't give you a date, though. And I think one of the things, the trends around substrate um, in general is, it's ready when it's ready. And I, I think that's actually a pretty good attitude. It would not be good as trying to release something that's broken, that causes a bunch of panic, that causes this thing. We have ideal milestones and kind of things we're gonna strive for, but really it's ready when it's ready. And I think that's the best thing for the community. Hi, Albert, my name. Um, how much can you put into a block? I mean, how big is the size of a transaction, especially this data field that you mentioned? How yeah. much can I put on extra data in there? Um, so this is a great question, and there's actually a feature specifically around this. This thing called weights. So this is actually also introduced. I don't know if we have a talk on it during this sub-zero, but this is something that's new since um, the last sub-zero. Um, and this weight mechanism basically allows you as the, as again, the runtime developer, as the blockchain developer, to determine exactly what these um, weights are. So there is an overall weight limit to um, your blockchain, how much a block can have, you can set that. Um, you can set how much of that weight limit is, um, is for normal transactions versus like system level transactions. I think on um, Polkadot we have like 70% on normal transactions, and we reserve an extra 30% for anything like, you know, extra. Um, and that's, that, that's not normally accessible by normal users. And then you also have the ability to control on a transaction level what each function would cost to your blockchain. So if you actually go look through the code of Substrate now, there's this like weight, you know, fixed weight kind of thing all over the code base. And this number is adjusted based off of the underlying logic. What doesn't make sense in Substrate um, and as a runtime developer is to like do the same kind of um, gas weighting thing that you would do in Ethereum where every single call is an opcode lookup and all that kind of stuff. It's just not efficient. What you should do because you control the runtime because it's not malicious code because it's something that you control is basically kind of um, ahead of time weight all these functions understand what the cost it is to your blockchain and make reasonable estimates of the weights um, uh, to your blockchain so um, the answer to your question is you control that um, and it's really up to you and what your blockchain does thank you yeah are, are there any profiling oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, Mike. Oh, sorry are there any profiling tools that help on that side? I think that's all in progress stuff. I mean, the, the weight thing is, is relatively new. I know internally, um, one of the things we've been doing is we've been, um, we created some scripts which basically um, sends thousands of transactions to various functions, trying to see what the cost um, of you know, increasing the database is, random cost of the function being called over and over is, that kind of stuff. And we, we have some rough estimates of what the weight is there. But I, I assume as time comes, these kind of tools we develop internally or externally. And we encourage everyone to, if, you, if this is something that you're familiar with, absolutely go ahead and go wild, you know? Um, we could definitely use it. I think that what we do right now is a little bit um, uh, immature. Cool. Well, thank you for your time. <laughs>